Well, who in here tonight wants to go to hell? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Where is it? Huh? Now, how do you know that? Where? See? Uh huh, yeah, uh huh. He got that nervous laugh. You always tell, ha ha ha, yeah, it's, uh -huh, it does. All right, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, let's take our Bible, turn to Deuteronomy 32. Appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate everybody online. I got a, a text message from uh, Dan Jennings today. It said that, yes, we go around and shake hands and hug one another in our home. All right, way to go. Just that one family, though, is all, you know, so. I don't know, probably a good idea. Everybody just needs a hug every now and then, amen? Amen. Um, Deuteronomy 32, I, what I did was I took every reference to hell that I could find. Hell, everlasting fire, torment, things like that. And I'm not done with the study. I'm not done putting this all together. But uh, there's, a, there's enough here to, to, to start work on it. Uh, we started last, uh, not last Sunday night, Sunday night before last, uh, we started on this teaching of hell. What does the Bible say? We'll go to the Lord in prayer and I'll read uh, this article that I read a couple weeks ago just to get you to understand why um, American Christianity and probably worldwide Christianity in general is in bad shape. And the bad shape is they don't believe in hell. They don't believe in the place of punishment. Everybody gets to go to heaven. I've been to these funerals where the worst people in the world were preached right into the pearly gates. And for no other reason other than we don't want to be mean and sound mean and so everybody goes to heaven. That doesn't give those who are alive and remain any real hope. It's the idea that they can live how they want to, reject Christ, reject faith, and still be rewarded for that. And I know me, I don't deserve any reward for the things I've done, but there is a reward of faith. And that reward is eternal life. There is a punishment for the lack thereof. And that is a place of everlasting torment. So, we started out last, uh, last time we were doing this, we started out with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And um, I think I laid the groundwork. If Jesus taught a parable, he wasn't lying. Wasn't kidding. The Jehovah's Witness told me on my doorstep, that's just a story that was made up and it teaches something. And I'm going, okay, yeah, I know what it teaches. Okay, the rich man lifted up his eyes being in torment. That's what it teaches. So anyway, we'll uh, go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask God's blessing and ask his help, ask his favor. And uh, while you're praying, tell him thank you. Tell him thank you, okay, that you don't have to go there. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for bringing us back together again. Thank you for these people, and I pray, Lord, that you would richly bless them. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just guide us into all truth, and we know that your word is truth. We know, Lord, that there's no secrets, no hidden meanings, no mystery doctrines that somebody, most people can't find out, and we've got to do something weird with it. We're just going to read the Bible. And believe what it says. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide us then into all truth. And Father, we do thank you that we were on the road to everlasting punishment, everlasting torment, everlasting fire. And Father, I've had enough of what this world has to provide. I don't want it worse for eternity. So I thank you, my Father for saving me, for having mercy on me, for forgiving me, and for saving me, Father, from hell's flames. Teach us your mighty word tonight. Let it go down in our hearts. Let it convict us. Let it straighten us out. Help us, dear God, to live this book, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The modern Bible translations like to take the word hell out of the Bible, 
replace it with grave or realm of the dead. Anything but hell. Anything but, you see, we teach our children that hell is a curse word. And it is. It's a curse word. Those who go there are cursed. And it's a terrible, terrible place. The Bible gives you actually more of a description of hell and in more places than it actually does of heaven. And so we're going to just believe what the Bible says. This article that I found, let's see what the title was. Will, will a loving God punish people forever in hell? And it said millions, millions believe that God is loving and merciful, but also that he has condemned millions to suffer torment for all eternity. Is something wrong with this picture or is, or is the problem a distorted belief about hell? So the article said the idea that God sentences people to eternal punishment is so repulsive it has turned some away from belief in God and Christianity. That's not hell's fault. That's not the Bible's fault. That's wicked man. That's his fault. He doesn't want to believe it so he turns from God. So the article said the problem is not that the Bible teaches this damnable doctrine but that men have misunderstood what the Bible says. Those who insist that the Bible teaches eternal torment by fire should ask whether such a belief is consistent with what the Bible teaches us about God. Now, you ask me that question, I say absolutely yes. God is a God of extremes. God is a God of extreme justice, which means those who do wrong will be punished in the most extreme way. But God is a God of extreme mercy. Meaning those who call upon it will get mercy to the uttermost, salvation to the uttermost, forgiveness to the uttermost, and eternal life to the uttermost of however far eternal life is, they're going to get it. God is that God. So the article said, for example, how could God justly deal with those who have lived and died without ever having received an opportunity to be saved? Psalm 9, 17 answers that question. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God when God created Adam Adam knew God Adam passed down his knowledge of God to his children Seth in the days of Seth we know for a fact that men began to call upon the name of the Lord they started decaying into wickedness and God destroyed them with the flood Noah knew God Noah taught his sons about God those men began to raise their children and as they separated out into the nations they forgot God they forgot him and that's been passed down so and there's there's more places uh, Romans chapter 1 we could look at that tonight and I think I looked at that um, the last time we were here let's look at the locations of hell Deuteronomy 32 22 are you there say amen now again, I'm not putting these on the screen. I still didn't put the projector up. So you, it's Bible turning night. Okay. Deuteronomy 30. I'll just give you a list here. Deuteronomy 32, Job 11, Psalm 139, Amos 9. Go. That's only four places. Deuteronomy 32, 22. Here's what God said. This is concerning the location of hell. For fire is kindled in mine anger. Now if you underline anything in your Bible, underline that. When God is angry, when God is angry, you, you search it out in the scripture. When God is angry, there's always fire. Always. Was God angry with Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma? What was the other name? Can't remember it. There's four cities that God destroyed. Was God angry with Sodom and Gomorrah? How did God treat Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire. God destroyed Sodom with fire. And the Bible tells us, Concerning God's nature that Sodom was to be an example to all of us who live after Making sure that if we're going to live ungodly That's the fate that we have coming our way Okay, and think about Think about What hurts the most? As far as things that can hurt your body Somebody punches you in the mouth it's spit blood for a while and you get over it. When you get burnt, the pain lasts for a long, long, long time. And it doesn't go away. Okay? So a fire is kindled in mine anger, 
and shall burn in, unto where? The lowest hell. Now, if this is the grave, how deep are graves? Six feet, 72 inches. I don't know who, I don't know who established that. But graves, ever since I've known, have been six feet and no deeper. There are things a lot deeper than a grave. This is not the grave he's talking about. This is, he mentioned fire in relation to, in fact, let, let's read this together. For a fire is kindled to mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. What does that tell you? That the place that the dead are turned to is, number one, the very lowest place that can be found anywhere and number two, it is on fire, period. And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. What is it that we know that abides under every mountain and every, um, every land mass that there is? What is under there? Lava. How hot is it? Very, very, very hot. Okay. Um, Mount Vesuvius. There was a town called Herculaneum. There's a town up here called Herculaneum. We call it Herky. We never say Herculaneum. The town of Herculaneum was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. And there are, I had Caleb look this up one day. There are people, the remains of their figures frozen in their tracks, literally as they're fleeing this hot molten ash coming down from Mount Vesuvius. They're fleeing the city and they are burned in their positions. And the ash covered the form of their body, and it hardened, and the, the midst of them decayed while that shell froze them in time. And they've, they've recovered their bodies out, and that's been thousands of years ago. Okay? One in particular, his mouth is wide open, screaming in horror just from a volcano exploding, okay? It's a terrible place. And one of these days, uh, turn to 2 Peter, if you would. I'll give you the explanation of what he's saying here. Shall consume the earth with her increase. Uh, anytime the Bible talks about increase, it's talking about the fruit of the field, wheat, barley, fruit, things like that, cattle. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 The Bible says, but beloved, be not ignorant. Of this, this is verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is with as, as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, to us, who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with what? A fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So what's going to happen is at the end of time, God is going to, number one, the, the entire universe is going to dissolve. The earth is going to melt from within. It's going to burn up everything you've done in this earth. Everything you've done, everything you work for, everything you put together, Everything you had is gone. The best thing for you to do in life is to already count it as gone. Best thing in the world to do. It, just think about it, Mike. Everything you've done productively with your, and unproductively with your life, okay? Your very best work. God showed me that years ago. 1993. You remember the 93 flood? We got hired to paint St. Louis Family Church in Chesterfield, um, where Kurt Warner went to church. And they were moving in this big warehouse, and we got hired to do the finished painting on this area. And I'm, back then, I'm going, I'm doing the Lord's work here. So I did my very best painting I've ever done in my life. Okay, talked to the pastor, he seemed like a nice guy, Jeff Perry. And, um, but anyway, I just remember going, this is the Lord's house. I gotta do my best work, okay? That was early, early spring, maybe February, March of 1993. And, if, and their goal was they wanted to be in that building by Easter, and they missed it by a couple Sundays. It just wasn't ready enough. And so not too long after that, they moved everything in there from where they were, 
And I wor was working on Saturday, and I come home, and Alan Barklage is flying his helicopter over that area, and the levee broke from the, from the Missouri River and flooded that whole, and I watched that church go underwater, and I went, my best work ever, buried under probably about 20 feet of water. I mean, it destroyed that whole place, and I went, great. I guess I need to find a different vocation now, so I go to preaching, so anyway. But, and it wasn't too long after that, God got, God got a hold of me. But anyway, um, that's, what he's, that's, that's what this verse is talking about. In Deuteronomy 32, 22, shall consume the earth with her increase. The day of the Lord is coming, and it's, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now look at verse 11. See, this, this is what teaching hell is all about. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking forward, hasting unto the coming of the day of God. You see, we're not fleeing from Mount Vesuvius. We're not running away from our own death in horror and terror. If you were to ask me today, surely the Lord should come quickly. Amen? Because you have those days where you just go, Lord, I would just soon you call me on home and let's be done with it. Can I hear you say amen? Even if you sigh doing it, all right? So, the location of hell is low. Uh, contrast that with heaven. Turn to Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Contrast that with heaven. How high is heaven? Huh? Are you sure? Because I had a guy tell me the other night, since the earth was flat, the heavens are not too far up there. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't. And I read, I read on Drudge Report the other day, well over 60% of Americans right now doubt the shape of the earth. And that's solely because of the internet. Okay? And I preached this Saturday. And I said, that is called a weak delusion. It don't take much, Mike, to see through that. And I tried to explain to the poor guy, measure the longitude lines south of the equator. It doesn't work. And every pilot, every seafaring navigator, everybody who does anything with maps, cartography, everybody knows that south of the equator, lines of longitude draw into themselves and not keep going farther away. Australia is not this long and this skinny. Okay? And, every, and, I, and he wouldn't, he just pff, wouldn't listen. There's a strong delusion coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.11 Lord shall send a strong delusion, they shall believe lie. If the, if the weak delusion captures people, the strong delusion, these people don't stand a chance. They do not stand a chance. So the heavens are higher than we can possibly fathom. Absolutely, we cannot even fathom how high the heavens, the final third heaven is above us right now. So that's the contrast. When Satan is thrown into the pit, what kind of pit is that? Bottomless. It is a continuous, every time you see Satan, he's falling. He's in heaven, and Jesus said, I saw him fall into the earth. Then he's in the earth, and then he's fallen into the pit, and he just keeps going down and going down and going down and going down. Some of you, your life was like that at one point. Amen. God raised you back up. Job 11, verse 7. Canst thou by searching find out God? And we've got the space telescopes now that can peer into the farthest reaches of our universe, farther than we ever imagined before. And we're still not seeing the end of it. And we cannot see God at the other side of it because we can't even see the end of our own universe. Can't see it. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Now, think about, think, think about it. This is God, right? Okay? If a pit is described as bottomless. What does that mean? 
that what's in it just keeps going down and down and down and down and down. For how long? Forever. Your Bible just told you that where God is is deeper than that. Deeper than an endless, bottomless hell. Fathom that. Next time you think God did something wrong. Next time you think God didn't know what he was doing. Fathom how God could be deeper than a pit with no end to it. And that's what it says, isn't it? Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure therein is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. God is higher than heaven is. And heaven's the highest. And God is deeper than hell. And hell has no end. Has no, has no fixed depth to it. It just keeps going, going lower, lower, lower all the time. And God is underneath that. I'll never, I'll never understand that. I'll never get that. Never see it. Hopefully when I get to heaven, I'll go, oh yeah, that makes sense now, you know. But not now, not now. So that's good. Uh, where else can we go? Psalm 139, turn there. Psalm 139. My question to you is, how true is the Bible? How true is it? Truer than car salesmen? Insurance guys? Okay. Congressmen? Preachers? There you go. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? What was Jonah thinking? What was he thinking? When Jonah, huh? Thought he could hide. So they threw him overboard. A great fish swallowed him up. God prepared a great, great fish to swallow him up. And when Jonah described his location, he said, the belly of hell. And yet God talked to him there, didn't he? Okay. So whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, Reconcile this. How can God be in hell? How can God? That's what it says, isn't it? If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Reconcile that scripturally. You want me to? Sure, I will. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 18, for Christ also once has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in where? Prison. Prison was hell. Where did Jesus go in his soul? Where did his soul go when he, when he died? They put his body in the grave, in the tomb, in a cave, literally. But where did his soul go? Went to the lowest place hell and what he did there was he preached to everybody there there was two sides to that there was and we read this last time abraham's bosom which was a place of comfort for those who lived by faith before the crucifixion and then there was hell where the rich man was and he was in torment so if you want a picture of this god drew it for you in genesis 40 Genesis 40, you have Joseph who goes to prison for something he didn't do, right? And while he's there, he preaches, prophesies to the baker and to the butler. To the butler, he says, in three days, you're going to be lifted up out of here, and you're going to be restored to be Pharaoh's cupbearer. But to the butler, he said, in three days, you're going to be lifted up, and you're going to be hanged from a tree, and you're going to be cast into a grave, okay? So he's preaching to two groups. Group A, in Abraham's bosom, he's setting them free. He's preaching the gospel of deliverance to them, and he says, you're now free to be with me in paradise. Then he says to those who are wicked, stay here for just two days. Just two days. 
and a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So just stay here for 2,000 years, or three. And uh, on the third day, we will take you out, we will judge you, and we will cast you into the lake of fire. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. Okay? That's, that's what that means. If, and back in Psalm 139, 8, thou, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And he was. He was. We also know that God is everywhere at all times and in all places. Okay? But we have that real picture of Christ, literally God, being in hell where David made his bed. That's where he abode uh, in Abraham's bosom in, in the lower parts of the earth until um, the crucifixion, until the resurrection. Then he was lifted up. Turn to Amos chapter 9. Amos, right before Jonah. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Amos chapter 9. Let's read verse 1. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth to them shall not flee away. He that escapeth to them shall not be delivered. Now, before I read the next verse, I want to give you, give you something that I think. Who knows who Elon Musk is? Elon Musk. He's the guy that founded... PayPal. So, all the money that people donate to our church through PayPal, Elon Musk gets a cut. They take, they take money out every time. I mean, that's, that's their service, that's what they do, and it, it's a convenience for us and for y'all, and so I get it. But he gets a cut of it. He founded PayPal. Now he owns a company called SpaceX, and he has built a dragon. He's built a dragon. He built a rocket called the Dragon. And he's been sending the Dragon up into the heights of the clouds, above the heights of the clouds, into the stars now for the past several years. Elon Musk and SpaceX is the company that is contracted with the International Space Station to supply men and supplies to the space station. Doing a, probably a better job sending stuff up than NASA ever did. Okay? You know why he's doing that? Number one, he's making pretty good money from it. Do you know why else he's doing it? Why is Elon Musk building these rockets to take people up into space? What does he want to do? Elon Musk is the guy leading the charge to send people to Mars. And they put a call out a couple years ago. We're looking for volunteers who will be the first people to land on Mars, and when we send you there, more than likely, we will not have a way to get you back to Earth. So if you go, you're dying there. And hundreds of thousands of people all over the world signed up and said, we want to be the first. We don't care if we die. We'll make history. Now you think about it. Let's read this next verse now. Verse 2, though they dig into hell... Thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to where? Heaven. Thence will I bring them down. Turn over to Obadiah. You have a double witness here. Obadiah. It's only one chapter. It's the next page. Verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Verse 4, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Two witnesses in your Bible tell you that even though men climbed up into the stars and made their abode there, God would drag them back down to face their judgment. Now, I, I just, I think, okay? I try to look ahead and figure out what people are doing. Why? What motivates them? Number one, man has had, ever since 
the fall, ever since creation, man has had this affinity with trying to climb up as high as he possibly can to elevate himself. So he built the Tower of Babel, and God put a stop to that. So then men started building tall buildings. And we're trying to build them ever taller and ever taller. One guy's building is tall. It's the tallest one. Another guy comes along, builds one taller than he is. So then we're not satisfied with that. So now we've got to send people. We sent, you know, astronauts up into the lower, at, the upper atmosphere. Then we put them in orbit. And then we sent them to the moon and back. And then we sent them back again. We sent them, they landed there. And they returned back. And we've done that now. We've been there, done that, accomplished that. We built, the eagle landed on the moon. Apollo 11 was the eagle. Remember what Buzz, uh, uh, Neil Armstrong said? Tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. The eagle, and the, the patch for Apollo 11 had an eagle with a branch in its hand landing on the moon, building its nest among the stars. Okay? Dun, 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 right? Freaky stuff. So now, man wants to escape to Mars. The science fiction writers have all written about this. They've all said, yeah, men's going to build rockets, and then in the future, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to go to Jupiter, and we're going to go, and we're going to go out into these other planets and around these other star systems. We're going to colonize the universe. We're going to escape Earth. And it's doom. We do, in other words, we destroyed it, but we think we can escape it by ascending up to the heights, of, above the heights of the clouds and ascending, living among the stars. And I bet you that that's in the minds of these people who are trying to leave Earth to go to Mars or go where, go build some lunar thing and live on the moon or what. And they're trying to find water on the moon. Why? So we can put a permanent base there and have people live there. Let's escape Earth and make God a liar. Now, for those of you who still think the earth is flat and the sun's only 3,000 miles up in the air and nobody ever goes to space. God just told you twice that man's going to do it. He just told you twice that man's going to do it and we've done it. And God said, if you do it, I'm going to drag you back down and I'm still going to judge you. You cannot escape God. Amen? Mankind won't do it. Now, that's the locations of hell. That's part of it. All right? Now, let's go and talk about the feelings of hell. 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Read verse 6 to yourself. Just kind of read that. Tell me what the feelings of hell are. What is it, Sasha? Sorrow. Multiple one, Not just one. Multiple sorrows. Now think about this, okay? Caleb, my mama had an expression with me, Okay? When I got caught doing something I shouldn't be doing, which 98% of the time I did, and mom said, give me your belt, what I immediately started saying was, I'm sorry, see the tears, I'll never do it again, I'm sorry, give me your belt, but I'm sorry. I had a um, family in our Christian school years ago. They went to one of these wacky churches that told them, that told those parents that if their children asked for forgiveness for doing something wrong, that the parents should then forgive them and not punish them. And so we had parents that we were not allowed to touch their children if they said they were sorry because that negated any punishment they would have ever gotten. And I want, to tell you, I want to tell you how kids are. Kids are smart. If a child can figure out he can play mama and daddy by saying, I'm sorry, he'll get away with everything throughout life. They'll get away with it all. Okay? And they think, see, the, the doctrine must have been lacking in that church where God takes his children 
and beats them severely for what they've done. You don't get away with nothing, do you? You get away with nothing when you're a child of God. He sees everything. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere and in every place. Amen? So, my mama would say, I'm going to make you sorry. So she would take my belt, and I'd lay across my bed, and she didn't just give me three licks. I think she just didn't count. And she got done when she felt like she was done. And she was right. I was extremely sorry <laughs> that I got caught doing that. I suppose that in a lot of things, it set in. I suppose that it did. Because I'm still a child of God because of it. She taught me right. See, the book of Proverbs says, when you spank a child, you're saving them from hell. Because you can either be sorry right now for everything you've done. And even though you know you've been forgiven, you're still sorry. You look back on it, don't you, Mike, and say, God, why did you let me do that? I wish I, wish I could go back in a little time machine. But you know what? That wouldn't change anything either. We still, our wicked nature, okay? Why is youth wasted on the young, amen? Okay? The wisdom shows up when the gray hairs show up, and we just lost all sense for nonsense anyway, so, you know, but God, God beat it out of us, what he did. God, let God make you sorry now, you will not be sorry later. You refuse sorrow now, think of the rich man. The rich man was told, in this life, you had everything. You could buy your way out of, rich people buy their way out of everything. Rich people never get in trouble. O.J. Simpson bought the best lawyers in the universe and got away with it, didn't he? He bought his way out. The rich can buy their way out of murder if they want to, okay? S sorry now, you're not sorry later. Sorrow, no sorrow now, you're going to spend eternity, eternity being sorry for everything you did. That's a long time. That's longer than 12 life sentences. That is eternity. The rich man, let's say that he lived at the time of Christ. He's been in hell now for 2,000 years. And everything that he did, he's been sorry for, for every second of every day that has passed on this earth. He's been sorrow multiplied for everything he's done. Okay? Uh, turn to Psalm 116. This is really, this is going to stick in you. Psalm 116. To any Jehovah's Witness friends listening to me that you've been told that your Bible doesn't teach that hell is a place where you experience pain. It's just the grave and you know nothing. Read your Bible. Well, read a King James first. You know, Brady, every time old Brady would call me on the phone, he knew the King James. But he was told to rely upon the New World Translation because I'd try to outwit him. And every verse I'd think of to try to get to Brady back when he was a J-Dub, he'd always pull out the New World Translation and they got, I think they covered all the bases in that translation. They destroyed the doctrines of the Bible. Psalm 116, verse 3. Here it is again, the sorrows of death compass me. Now, if you're dead, how can you be sorry? It's a different type of death, isn't it? It's not like the life that you and I are going to have in eternity. It is the exact opposite of that. We're going to live in light. They are going to be dead, but aware in darkness. The sorrows of death compass me, and look at the next phrase. Pains of hell. Get hold upon me. Pains, and there it again, it's multiplied. It's not just one pain. That's how I feel today. Okay? This is a bad day for me to talk about pain in hell. 
because my nerves have literally just been firing today all over my body different places you look at Courtney she's going through the same thing okay mine I didn't know I could pass down genes to a child after the child was born I got my genes electrocuted and somehow she ended up with them I don't get that but anyway but I've I've been in pain and they they prayed over me yesterday and they said boy it's your back and I said no it's not just my back it's everything everything hurts today and it makes me very tired it makes me dreary so when I think about this I think of how bad it would be if I were in hell I don't want it now my remedy on days like this is to sleep because when I sleep you're not in pain you're asleep okay there is no sleep and there is no rest in hell you know even the body right now the body has a way of shutting itself down when it's got when it's overloaded you know that right people pass out when they hear news that startles them or whatever okay they'll, they'll pass out or when some people just get in such agonizing pain they go into shock and they just shut down in hell that's removed there is no barrier and no limit to the amount of pain that people are in right now it is exceeding you know what the word exceed means here's the limit here's 55 miles an hour right here's 70 <laughs> this is the limit you exceeded the limit right the pains are exceeding they have gone past your mortal limit and you're experiencing every one of them and it never stops and I figured this out when I was nine there used to be a movie and if you go on YouTube you can find it and it is the cheesiest worst acted worst directed worst special effects movie in the entire universe It's made in the early 70s with hippies it's called the burning hell back in the 70s and early 80s we would rent we would literally get 16 millimeter films and we used to have a film projector and a screen and we would hold special evangelistic services and we wouldn't pass out flyers all over town inviting people to come see this film and I remember bringing buddies from school to this church when I was a kid to watch this film and one of my next door neighbors it scared him so much he went down crying bawling his eyes out to the altar now it didn't take hold he's still lost to this day but it scared him so bad just this cheesy it's called the burning hell look it up not now I'm preaching stop it I know about multiple tabs and windows and all that okay and uh, I think Jack Hiles has a little piece in it where he talks and gives the, gives the gospel. But the idea is when you stop and think about hell and you, you read this Bible and see what it says, it'll stop you and you're, you'll sober up. When God inflicts pain upon you for something you did, he's, remind, he's reminding you, I have limits. Hell doesn't. He's chastising you. He's straightening you. He's reminding you, you're going to be my son. You're going to be my child. You don't act this way. Amen? Let me read this verse and we'll go. The sorrows of death can pass me and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then, what's the purpose of us teaching on hell? Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my what? Your flesh is going nowhere. You can go and dig up people that's been dead in the ground for thousands of years, right? Their body is still there. That's not hell. 
their soul was delivered over to a place where the limitations of the mortal body are removed and the pain is exceeding and it never stops. And when God hits you with just a little pain, that should be enough to stop you right there and say, God, deliver my soul. Deliver my soul. Father in heaven, teach us your ways. Teach us, God, about your authority, your justice. Father, teach us about how extremely wrathful you can be. And then teach us, Lord, about how extremely blissful you are and loving. Father, we have known pain and we have known love on this earth. We have never experienced hell and we have yet to experience heaven. So teach us, Lord, about that while we're here. So we cry unto you, deliver our soul from hell. Bless your word tonight. Dismiss us now in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen.